Welcome back to Canada's Court, and it's time to take a look at the Toronto Raptors as their 2024-2025 roster starts to take shape. There's been a handful of draft picks, a trade, a pair of notable extensions, and one player notably not re-signed yet. And to talk about all this is Coach O once again. Coach O is obviously a regular on Canada's Court and the host of his own Project 365 podcast, Coach O. Uh, great to have you back again. It is always a pleasure to be on Canada's Court. <laughs> Always a I appreciate that. Thank I you, Phil. Appreciate, appreciate that. you. And mm. I need to apologize to you and to all the fans out there because I know you 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 uh, you you watch uh, regularly. Because mm-hmm. I took a bit of a break from Canada's court because I kind of had to you know get married and have a wedding and all that stuff, so that took up a little bit of time. But uh, you know we're back at it, and I'm happy to be uh, talking about basketball again. No, oh, absolutely. But you know you enjoy your time, man. It's like you know it's an eventful summer. I think. Um, People in this profession really understand that, like, the downtime and the family time is, has to be valued, right? So, um, you know, I'm not I'm not holding it against you. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. We are going to have a busy summer here. We got the – we're going to be talking about the, the kind of off season for the Toronto Raptors and then the Olympics. That's going to be a lot of fun with uh, both the men's and women's team, three-on-three teams. We're going to have lots to uh, talk about, I think, over the next uh, month or so uh, let's get right into it now. The Raptors, uh, as you know, uh, big news from the Raptors. Probably the biggest thing is Scotty Barnes signing a five-year rookie extension worth up to $270 million. Uh, that's a lot of money, but th- they kind of had to do that, right? Like that's a, that's a, that's a bit of a no-brainer signing your, your franchise player to the, whatever money you, he wants. Absolutely. And I think um, this is something that we talked about before. Um, when you get a good chance of drafting a high prospect player, um, a lot of franchises in the NBA, um, they put a lot of pride into drafting the right guys and be able to retain, right? So when you get a player of Scotty's caliber, that's someone that you're willing to invest in. And obviously by being getting him to get that rookie extension, you're kind of setting yourself up in a way for what the future of your franchise is going to be. What's interesting about this, though, is I think we're going to get into this, but you now may start seeing certain signings kind of shape up the future of the Toronto Raptors. Yeah, we we absolutely are, and that's actually exactly what kind of the the next bit was because they obviously also extended Emmanuel quickly – that one to a five-year, one hundred and seventy-five million dollars. That's thirty-five million a year, which you know might seem like a lot, but uh, he's clearly cemented himself as a, a pretty important player. W- what do you think of that deal? Is this a is this a good fit around Scotty Barnes, who they've clearly committed to? No, you know me, Phil. I always like talking about the fit, and I think with Scotty, you have a pass-first player, you have a versatile defender, you have somebody who's going to be a great rebounder, right? Um, someone who's going to make a lot of plays with the ball, but when the floor tends to shrink a little bit when he is not quite there yet with his three-point shooting ability, having someone like Emmanuel Quigley that's able to make off-the-dribble threes, right? Just being able to create his own shot, make things off the bounce, it's something that we've lacked in Toronto for a little while. Because if you got to think, the last player that we had of his caliber that was able to create one-on-one like that was probably Fred Van Vliet if we're talking about the guard position. So by us committing to having someone like that, you kind of set yourself up to see the pairing. I'll be very interested to see if we see a bit more um, Scotty Barnes screening for Emmanuel Quigley and then maybe him short rolling and just see how we're able to play off of that. So I like the pairing. I like the pairing. I think it also sets us up for – Um, what we may want to be able to see for the future for the Raptors. Well, yeah, we've got those two under contract for five years. You know that that gives those guys a lot of time to work together and you can kind of, there's a bit more clarity now because last season was like, there was no clarity whatsoever. You had OG, you had Pascal Siakam and, and, it seemed like it was it was clear they were going to trade those guys, but there was also this oh, but we still want to be good, all that kind of thing. So now everyone knows for sure this is kind of the core of the roster, and 
whether that's the coaching staff, development, they can all really focus in on making these pieces work, right? Absolutely. And we didn't even get a chance to talk about, you know, the potential other players, right? So you're talking about mm-hmm. um, Emmanuel Quigley being someone that's probably going to be primarily um, on the ball as a primary um, decision maker. You have Scotty, who has the ability to be the secondary decision maker, but we can't forget about R.J. Barrett, too. With R.J. Barrett being so physical, with him taking strides and developing that outside game, um, you're realizing that the Raptors are going to have a very balanced um, kind of front to their attack. And that's one of the things and one of the ways where in the NBA teams are starting to get so good that you have to have multiple ways of attacking certain defenses, right? Especially when we don't have the quality. Um, are we, I'm going to say the quality of superstars that you're looking at. Um, you know, Denver may have with Jokic or Milwaukee may have with um, Giannis, right? Us being able to have very solid players that fit well together, I think goes a longer way than us just trying to strike gold and try to get a superstar. And yeah, let's talk about some of those players who are now being added to the roster. It was a big draft for Toronto. They made a a lot of picks, most of them in the second round, but still a a lot of picks. Um, They didn't keep their own pick because of the the way the lottery balls bounced. The Spurs kept their pick at eighth, which they even ended up trading, so didn't even use it. But uh, the Raptors did draft with the 19th pick, Jacoby Walter of Baylor. Uh, that's uh, from their their trades uh, last at the the trade that well before the trade deadline. Uh, but what do you think of Jacoby Walter for the Raptors? He's kind of like a like you said, another guy who can create his own shot. He's a good shooter. He can score. Um, how do you feel like that kind of fits in with what the Raptors already have? I like I like all things Baylor, right? So I like <laughs> I like players that come from Baylor. Um, very well prepared. Uh, they're going to be players that are going to come into the NBA um, with a foundation that you can build on. I think where it gets very interesting for the Raptors is like now you have Jacoby Walter, right? That is now potentially in a little bit of a competition. We did trade for Davion Mitchell as well, right? So that creates a bit more competition at that position. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's opportunity, right? The Raptors are known for being able to play a lot of players, right? The Raptors are known for developing players as well. So there probably will be a couple of times where we may, we may see him in the G league and that's okay because what you really want to focus on as a young player is you want to be able to learn as much as possible and get as much on ball reps as possible. So for someone like that, like you just want them to be able to go into a situation where they're going to be able to continue developing their game, right? So the competition is good. The situation is good. There's going to be opportunity. We have to be hopeful that it's going to be a good situation for Jacoby Walter. And uh, I've got I've got no sponsorships here. This isn't an ad. But if I were <laughs> uh, going to give you a recommendation, I would say it's a good year to buy um, Raptors 905 tickets. I mean – we're going to talk about a number of uh, second round picks here who are all probably going to play a good chunk of time uh, on the Raptors 905 team. And that's going to be kind of fun to watch because you, you've seen, you know, not everybody that the Raptors send to the 905 becomes a star, but you've seen guys like Fred Van Vliet and Pascal Siakam, you know, in their rookie years, play some significant time there and then become big, big players. So, any number of these players that we talked to over this episode, there's no guarantee that anyone's going to become a star, but there is a chance that, you know, one of these guys or, or multiple of these guys has that kind of potential. And, you know, it's a lot cheaper to go to a 905 game than it is to a Raptors game. So you might get your uh, get ahead of things a little bit there. Absolutely. And that's why I love um, I love Summer League because I love to see the different situations that we put these young players in, right? So it's Summer League being like, just around the corner, like we're potentially mm-hmm. setting ourselves up for something where we're able to see maybe s- certain players be able to grow like faster. You don't know. So that's why I find it very interesting for sure. Yeah, I've always wanted to. This hasn't been the year because, as I mentioned, it's already a busy year. But I've always wanted to go and spend a, a week down in Vegas for Summer League. I think that would be a lot of fun. And like you said, there's, it'd be really interesting to see some of these players. But we're going to watch them online. We'll watch them on TV. It'll be good. Um, I've got a bit of a fun question here for you. I mentioned you know, Jacoby Walter drafted by the Raptors. 
Jacoby is supposedly, this is what they say on the broadcast, uh, his name is a combination of Jordan and Kobe, two great basketball players. So what I want to know is, and you didn't prepare for this, so I apologize, <laughs> but if you had to be named after your two favorite basketball players, what would it be? I'll, I'll let you think while I say mine, which would probably either be Kai Nash, a combination of Kyle Lowry and Steve Nash, or Joe Tumbo, a combination <laughs> of Jokic and Dikembe Mutombo. Uh, but uh, I, I'm curious to see what, if you combine your two favorite players of all time, what that would look like. Ooh, so I grew up, I'm a big, I'm a big LeBron guy. I just grew up with LeBron, right? So that mm -hmm. would have to be a LeBron in there. And the second one is kind of funny. Metal World Peace was always one of my favorite. But when I grew up, his name was Ron Artest. His name was Ron Artest back then. So I don't know. Do we have LeBron? <laughs> or do we have a La Meta? I don't know. La Meta is kind of cool. I La like World La Meta. Peace. That sounds nice. La World yeah. Peace. <laughs> there you go. That's a good one. That's a good one. I think LeBron might not be as. Uh, yeah. But it works. It works. Yeah. Um, moving back on to the draft, the Raptors also had the 31st pick. Uh, there was some talk that they might trade it because it was, it was actually really interesting. I mean, now this year they had the, the two day draft. So there was a lot of discussion in between the first and the second day. It's like, Ooh, what's going to happen here? I think, uh, I think it worked from the NBA. It created a little bit more discussion and, and intrigue going into day number two. What do you think? No, absolutely. And, um, what I like too, is that they, didn't let it drag on, right? So the day number two was a bit earlier, which I found was pretty good from uh, them because teams had the opportunity to go back after the draft, um, talk to their parties. They had the chance to, you know, make a couple last minute phone calls and that kind of stuff, right? So I like that part. Um, I think for me, it it's kind of special. I still think that it didn't really take out the special of it but what i mean by that is like i think it was still an opportunity for those second rounders to still feel like they had their own thing which i think is also very important because i think the 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 salaries in the nbas have changed so much that now you have second year players who could potentially get guaranteed contracts right so i think the way that they did it was was different but i think it, there's some good in it because i think what that kind of shows um to these second rounders is that like okay well you still matter in a way because I'm not going to lie to you. When everything was done in one day, most people tune tune out right after um, the first round, right? So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Positive. Usually yeah. not as much fanfare, but um, more more opportunity for shine for these guys for sure. The Raptors ended up drafting uh, Jonathan Mobo. Uh, who played for San Francisco? He's a six foot six forward, really athletic finisher, solid passing, passing, uh, good defense, and uh, maybe most importantly, a good friend of Scotty Barnes. So that's uh, uh, you. You can already see not only are they building players around him, they're making sure uh, he's uh, he, he's happy there. But another player who could be uh, uh, probably not a huge rotation player this season, but someone to look forward to going forward. Yeah, no, for sure. I think, again, player development is going to be very important. That's one of the keys in this draft, right? You want to be able to um, – you're drafting – and one of my good friends um, that I was talking to about the draft, um, he mentioned that this draft is not – a lot of people say it's a weak draft. It's not a weak draft. It's a draft of development where your player development is going to be put to a test, right? So either you're – drafting these players because you see potential in them and you're going to make them get to the next level or you're setting yourself up to maybe trade certain pieces where maybe other teams see value in certain guys right so this is it's not different from mobile you're going to have to come into a situation where you're going to have to learn you're going to be in a really good situation because the raptors have done really good with players of your archetype you've done really good with six six six, seven players that are able to defend, move the way that he does. So that's an interesting one to definitely to keep an eye out for. And it kind of shows um, what the Raptors have been building towards. I mean, last season when they hired Coach Darko, it, especially it being his, his first year as a head coach, it was clear they were going towards development. So if their their coaching staff is focused on that this season, which I think – Obviously, they will be. I don't think we're 
expected to the Raptors are expected to be contenders next season. Mm-hmm. So I'm sure uh, development will be first and foremost. Um, you know, there's there's a real opportunity for that, and they really you know doubled down on that by even getting another, actually two additional second round picks. Um, the Raptors made a, a trade for with the Sacramento Kings, which was very interesting. They traded um, Jaden McDaniels, Jalen McDaniels rather, for um, the 45th pick, but also for Davion Mitchell and Sasha Vizankov. I think I said it right, Vizankov. Um, that's a that's a pretty uh, savvy move from Masai Ujiri there, kind of taking a player that, wasn't figuring to be a part of the Raptors rotation going forward and really didn't have strong a year. Obviously it was a financial move for the Kings. They did it to get out some salary, but Davion Mitchell is a, a nice acquisition for the Raptors. Very nice piece. And that's a, that's a young player that, again, we talk about the, mm. the, a lot of people like to look at the ceiling of players, right? But a lot of times you really want to start looking at the floor, right? How, how high is our floor, right? If you're saying that Davion Mitchell could be in your rotation and he can provide you solid minutes, able to change the pace of the game, right? Defensively, able to get you some buckets offensively, that's not a bad player to have in your rotation. And we've seen some of the things that we had. Heck, he was he was um, in a lot of situations seen as potentially some, one of the players that could be considered to be in one of those defensive awards. He's a really good one-on-one defender. He's, he makes good decisions off the ball. Still has to work a little bit more on his jump shot, but as still someone that potentially you may be able to see. I kind of see it a little bit. The role that I would potentially envision with him would probably be something similar to what Jose Alvarado is doing with the New Orleans uh, Pelicans, right? Just somebody that comes in and he has to be on the scouting report because he changes the pace of the game. And just another player that's, like we said, young. Um, I don't think Sasha Vizankov is going – there's been a lot of I, 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 um, conversation about him on Twitter. It looks like he just signed uh, with uh, Olympica. So, like, it's not even clear if he's going to be a member of the team, but I don't think that was the, the reason the Raptors made the deal. And then, of course, the 45th pick, we talked about him a little bit before we started recording. Uh, Jamal Shedd is, you know, uh, again, another prospect, but – Someone who who brings a lot defensively and and uh, you know can really impact the game, right? Yeah, he's Houston, right? Houston Cougars. Yeah. We know what they do, man. <laughs> they come in with that tough mentality. Um, they're gonna defend. They take pride in their defense, which is again very valuable f- to have. Um, r- p- players that maybe are not gonna get a lot of minutes. You want to make sure that they compete. That's the biggest thing. Right. So you're getting someone that's going to compete, someone that's definitely going to be um, um, willing. He's going to he's going to sacrifice his body on every possession. That's something that's very valuable. And again, because of the situation with the Raptors may spend a lot of time in the G League. But but the really nice part about it is just that this year took a lot of strides at making good decisions with the basketball. Right. So Houston is known to be a team that is really good defensively, but struggles to score in the half court. He was one of their closers this year, right? So Jamal Shedd is definitely going to be someone to um, that has that baseline to be able to um, potentially do something for the Raptors. We never know, right? But we write development. It may be a good thing. And it wouldn't be the first time a, 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 a maybe undersized, scrappy point guard did really well for the Toronto Raptors. We've got a, a bit of a history with that. Absolutely. But, um, yeah, there's definitely – and then lastly, just the last bit of draft news, the Raptors did play, pay uh, about a million dollars reportedly to get the 57th pick of the draft, which was uh, uh, Ulrich Shamshe. Um Again, another player that you know we're, we're not going to see much of on the Raptors roster, but just really another uh, opportunity. Actually, and I forget, there's one more. They also signed undrafted Brendan Carlson uh, from the University of Utah, a seven footer who can shoot threes, which is always uh, nice to have. Um, but yeah, just really kind of loading up on young players that they can work with and they can develop. There's no way they're going to hit it out of the park on each and every one of these picks. But if one or two of them works out to be a starter or a rotation player, that that's brilliant, right? The key, the key with what you said right there is 
there's another layer to it where they were able to draft different kind of players, right? Because mm-hmm. when you're unsure about which direction you're going to go, you want to have as many different avenues as possible, right? We know what we can do with six, seven that can move really well, right? But you're telling me a seven footer that potentially is able to step out and knock down threes. Um, that adds a different dimension, right? So in terms of player development, it's like it's it's pretty fun to have different kind of archetypes that you could work with. Yeah, it's very exciting and very interesting indeed. And again, I'm saying it, you got to go get your Raptors 905 tickets this year. I <laughs> think there's going to be a lot of fun there. For sure. Uh, especially maybe a lot of people trying to get the uh, the uh, game when the Lakers uh, G League team comes into town with Bronny James uh potentially uh, obviously drafted by the Lakers going to be playing with his father LeBron James um a little bit of kind of back and forth about that one with uh, Bronny maybe not having a, a a standout college career but still getting drafted by his dad's team what 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 do you make of that is that just do you think there's there's something there or is this just as a case of yeah, his dad plays, and you got to keep his dad happy. Cause you know, he's it, wrong. yeah, you know, like there's there's different layers to it, and it's like people are gonna say whatever they want, but it's definitely someone that it's not like he never played, right? He mm. he's been a team player um, since AAU days when he hopped on the scene. Right. We remember all these old uh, videos of LeBron James Duncan in the in the warmups when he was coaching his uh, his younger his son's team. You know, like it's not someone that hasn't been accustomed to the kind of lifestyle. Right. Mm-hmm. What's interesting with this is I wish that people would give it a chance because it's something that we've never seen before. Right. So with us having never seen this, you don't know how much someone persevered through situations. Like, imagine you wanting to go into a profession and your father has been seen as the greatest of one of the greatest of all time, arguably one of the greatest of all time. There's some kind of mental fortitude that you have to have to be able to strive into this environment. So you've been in the limelight since young. Right. So what's interesting about this and why I kind of enjoy it is just because a lot of people are talking about he should have stayed in college. But if he would have stayed in college. The Bronny that we would have at 22, if if he stayed in college, would be way less advanced than the Bronny that gets to be in an NBA kind of type of environment in training for the next three years, right? So 22, 22 Bronny in the NBA and 22 Bronny in college is two different kind of players, right? Because what people don't think about is that you got to think about who is he going up against? Am I, I'm going up against... A player that maybe if I, you know, potentially if he would have stayed in South Carolina, uh, the University of South Carolina, he would be going against a player that potentially may not go to the NBA, right? Now you get to go up against D'Angelo Russell, <laughs> right? So it's like it's it's different. Yeah, yeah. It's different. Like people just got to give it a chance. I know like, you know, a lot of people are going to be saying like, okay, it's unfair for the other players. Now. But the reality is just like it's it's just life, right? Life just ended up. Um, giving him certain cards, and we're not even going to even talk about the fact that he had a slow start to his college career because of that heart incident last summer, right? So it's mm-hmm. like, it's like there's, there's, we got to give it a chance, man. We got to give it a chance. Yeah, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> and, and and the other thing is, you know, he was drafted. I think it was the 55th pick. If mm-hmm. I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong. Um, your chances of drafting a superstar there are are slim to none. Yeah. So taking a flyer on your your best player's kid maybe isn't the worst. Like it, it's not like the opportunity cost was insane. You they didn't lose their first round pick. They lose one. They used one of their final second round picks. So there's there's he doesn't have to be incredible for that pick to work out. Mm-hmm. I agree. I agree. Hundred percent. Um, the final bit of draft news and Candace Court news we'll talk about is Zach Eady in the lottery getting drafted ninth overall. We talked a lot about Zach Eady during March Madness and um, kind of really exciting, you know, for Canada basketball, maybe not for their Olympic team because he's no longer going to be playing for the Olympic team, uh, but really exciting for, you know, the nation to see 
another guy get drafted ninth um, and going to a place where he might get some uh, considerable minutes. Like uh, he's going to, there's, they kind of have a bit of a hole at center there and Memphis Grizzlies, you know, if, if they're fully healthy, they're a team that, that could be a, a, a team to reckon with in the West. He definitely went somewhere where, you know, you could see a fit because there was a need, right? You're talking about someone that, is going to an organization that, you know, we saw how valuable Steven Adams was to them. So there's potential for Zach Eady to be able to cover up certain holes that Steven Adams left when he ended up moving, right? We know Jaron Jackson, uh, Jaron Jackson Jr. and how valuable he is to that team, but there's definitely some situations where you don't want Jaron Jackson to have to guard the, the biggest, but because he's so valuable to your offense, right? If Zach Eady can give you a solid 12 to 8, 16 minutes, right, that relieves a lot of pressure off of Jaron Jackson Jr. And again, Zach Eady is somebody that impressed me this year. I didn't think he was going to be able to um, come back after having a big year last year and come and do it again. Because I thought like the, the attention to detail and how focused people would be on the fact that he was um, already a national player of the year. I thought that he was going to – I was interested to see how he would react to it. But he's someone that has shown that if put in the right situation and given touches, he could affect the game. He never stopped moving, never stopped posting. He would always rebound. Um, he would alter shots, right? Biggest thing what I'm going to be willing – what I want to be able to see from Zach Eady is just that defensively, um, how different is it? Guarding NBA level guards, NBA level talent, NBA t- level screen rollers, right? I want to see how Zach Eady adapts to that. I know he's someone that definitely has a really high IQ and is still pretty young playing the game of basketball, right? Like, I think he started playing when he was like mm-hmm. 14, 14, if I'm not mistaken. So, something like something that. Like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, young. Yeah, he was young. So, like, I think there is room for him to grow, but. Again, you're looking at Memphis, who's a team that, okay, it's almost like they're telling you, we we really need you. We could use you, but take your time, you know, <laughs> learn. So I think it's yeah. an interesting, it's a very interesting um, situation for Zach Eady, for sure. A bit bummed that I won't see him, things- that I won't see him uh, in the Olympics. Just a little bit bummed. Just a little bit. Yeah, yeah, that is too yeah. bad. That is one yeah. of the challenges of Canada having all these, you know, uh, NBA level players. Is- yeah. You're, you're, especially at that point, like, you know, Shea Gilgis Alexander wants to play in the Olympics. He's going to, he's going to play in the Olympics, right? They're, mm-hmm. they're not going to try and boss him mm-hmm. around too much. Mm-hmm. But Zach Eady, who's just gotten drafted, he wants to, you know, make money and play professional basketball. It's a tough one, but I agree. It would have been nice to see him. Mm-hmm. I'm sure there's, there would have been some games. I mean, the, the schedule's come out. There would have been some games where he would have uh, seen some time and, and been mm-hmm. a helpful player. Absolutely. And, and I think one of the things, um, just lastly on Zach Eady, is he's also a good screen setter, which I think will pair nicely with you know someone like John Morant who can get downhill so quickly. Uh-huh. So I think there's there's more to his game offensively than just being a guy who can you know hit a hit a, a little hook shot and and get a, a putback right. So I think it, it will be uh, it will be fun to watch him on Memphis, but definitely disappointing when I'm seeing him at the Olympics. Um, lastly, uh, not lastly, we're, we're out of the draft. That's it. That's all the draft stuff I had to talk about. Unless there was anything else you wanted to talk about. I think that's it. No, again, just circling, tying it all back. I think it's, it's going to be interesting because this is the draft that we may not have seen, um, potential in players on draft night, but we may look back at this draft and be like, okay, there was so much talent in this, right? That's the part I'm the most excited Mm -hmm. about. I don't know. What about you? I I think you you just nailed it. I think one of the parts of this draft wasn't so much that it was a weak draft. Like you, like you said, it's not a weak draft, but it's just, there wasn't the same consensus on, okay, this guy's for sure a star and this guy's a star and this guy's a star. There wasn't those players where you're like, this is a, a potential Hall of Famer. But mm-hmm. there's always going to be people who emerge as, oh, that guy. Yeah. yeah. He really, we, we didn't see it, see what he was. And and maybe I'm going a little too deep into this. But I think, you know, I, I've heard it. Some people talk about how 
you know, even even the pandemic has impacted some of this stuff where we didn't get to see guys as well. So I don't know. It's going to be it's going to be exciting to see, you know, who emerges and hopefully one of the many guys the Raptors drafted is one of those guys. Yeah, who knows? <laughs> no, absolutely. We got to be um, hopeful. <laughs> we got to be hopeful. Back to the Raptors. Uh, let's talk about Gary Trent. He had a bit of an underwhelming year for the Raptors. He, as of recording this on Sunday night, is not on the Raptors roster. He hasn't been signed anywhere. Uh, Michael Grange of Sportsnet is reporting that the market for him is under the mid-level exception, which is, I'm sure, not what he was dreaming for. It seems pretty clearly like the the Raptors are moving on from him and just going to go with kind of those those younger players like, you know, not not just the guys they drafted, but Grady Dick and, and that kind of thing to fill out that rotation. Yeah, no, I think, you know, it's like it's you – know, I personally, I liked the dynamic that Gary Trent brought mm-hmm. to us. Um, I just like him being like a threat, right, to be able to make those kind of like timely threes that we needed. Um, you know, it's the way the business goes, but I think um, I can foresee him potentially being picked up somewhere closer to the the trade deadline. Right. And then just being able to get on the team. Right. So I don't, his, the skill is too valuable to not be yeah. taken. Right. Like it's obviously for the Raptors, may not, it may not work out right now, but that's definitely somebody that like to keep on the radar, because I think, you know, you're looking at different teams. You, you don't know. Knock on wood. There's injuries and all that. You're all, mm-hmm. once you get an extra shooter, you never say no to extra shooters. <laughs> Yeah, and I don't think his I don't think his NBA career is over. I think it's just I think he's just not going to get a big payday that he wants, and maybe maybe he takes a one year contract, a little bit on himself, and and uh, uh, really lights it up for some team. But I, I it just doesn't seem like it's going to be the Raptors. Otherwise, I imagine a deal would have been done already. Mm-hmm. Um, the other player that's a big question mark on the Raptors is Bruce Brown, who is still on the roster again as of recording. Uh, what do you think happens to him? Is he going to be – because that's another player who's got lots of skills that are really helpful, even more so, I think, than Gary Trent, where he can move off the ball really well and is uh, – you know, he was a big piece for the Denver Nuggets when they won the championship. you got to imagine he's going to be moved, if not now, at least by the trade deadline to somebody who is really more looking to win right now. No, that's a, that's 100% it. And I think, you know, we were talking about it. It's also fit, right? There's – certain timelines that need to fit with the players within your own organization, right? Um, You made the decision to um, give the keys to the franchise to Scotty Barnes, right? So it's like things have to fit a certain way for when when Scotty Barnes gets to year six, you have to be – he has to be sure about which direction the the organization is going, right? So, again, it's it's, – things are – being a, becoming a bit more tricky with this with the new CBA and everything, so it's like, mm. so it's like, we gotta we gotta also take that into consideration, right? Like, that's the one thing about us in Toronto. Like, we we love our players when they come here and we support them, but there's also the business part of them where it's like, the business part where it's like, you know, sometimes like just you contractually you can't make certain moves, and yep. you know what, Masai being Masai, being, you know, the businessman that he is and being someone that has a lot of experience and is very successful is going to have to look out on what's the best for the organization. And he's painted a clear picture of where he thinks the organization is going. So we're going to have to wait and see. All right. So as you said, the next big thing that's coming up for the Raptors is the summer league. Uh, I took a quick breeze at the roster. It's mostly those those guys that are drafted. I believe Grady Dick's still in there. I believe Ochai Abaji's on there as well. Um, what are you – you talked about seeing different players in different situations. What are you hoping to, to see at Summer League from some of these players that we've talked about and, and maybe some of the players we haven't? A lot of the players that are going to be – that are going to be on that team – Um, you're going into it with the potential to create an opportunity for yourself, right? Um, Since we didn't have a high, high, high pick 
everything is up for grabs, right? You know how usually in the summer league, like if somebody's in the first or second pick, they tend to shut them down after game two, right? So we have the opportunity to potentially have a consistent roster, right, throughout the summer league. So what I'm looking forward to do, what I'm looking forward to seeing from the Raptors, from these young players is just are you competing on the defensive end? Are you making good decisions, right? If you're a primary ball handler, and Grady's going to get a lot of opportunity to be a primary ball handler in these situations, right? Um, I want to see what kind of de- what kind of decisions he makes with the ball, right? I want to see are we cutting, are we rebounding? Those are the main things. Like summer league is a bit, it's it's almost like an experiment. You don't want to you want to put mm-hmm. a lot of value into it, but you also don't want to. So it's like finding that balance and just trying to make sure that we focus on the right things. I think that would be the biggest thing. I think it's a lot like, you know, when you talk about preseason, which people say, you know, it doesn't, the results obviously don't matter, but it's seeing our people, you know, making the right reads. Are they, is the kind of foundation there yep. uh, for these players and these, these, the, the, the coaches, well, not the coaches, but the players, it's going to be uh it's going to be fun to watch. Um, but yeah, is there anything else uh, Raptors related? Do you think we should have touched on? I think we, uh, as much as we could in 35 minutes, covered the the gambit of it. No, absolutely. Um, it's gonna be fun. It's gonna be a, uh, it's gonna be a interesting, interesting time <laughs> for us to see because like we could go so many different directions, right, with the Raptors, right? So I think yep. we are also setting ourselves up to potentially see um, how we build our future. Which is always exciting, right? It is, and I'm I'm very curious to see how much they give minutes to some of these young guys because they're still like, while obviously they're focused on development and they're not, they're, there's no kind of misconception that they're winning the championship next year. You still have players who are talented players, and I know last season didn't end well, but there was a lot of injuries. But, I mean, if you look at your core of uh, Quickly and Barrett and uh, and Scotty Barnes and Grady Dick and, and Jakob Pertl and uh, you got Kelly Olenek, like there's, there's, there's some players there, and I, I don't know. I, I'm always optimistic, so i got to be careful. But I don't think that sounds like a team that's built to – I don't think they're tanking is what I guess I'm trying to say. I don't think they're going to try and be a, a bottom feeder team this year. I also don't think they're going to be a, a top playoff seed. Yeah, I think the bottom half of the of the East is like pretty much wide open if you're trying to make a run for that play-in. Um, yeah, we'll have to wait and see because a lot of times, like a lot of teams, what they'll do is that they'll see – they'll start off the season and they'll see how it is and towards Christmas they make a decision on which on which way they're trying to go, right? I know yep. the Raptors f- feel like they want to be a winning organization, right? So I don't expect them to just give up, right? They're these We know NBA players. NBA players are very competitive, right? So um, mm-hmm. it'll be interesting to see. I think the next time we'll be able to ask that question will probably be like a bit closer to Christmas because then yeah. you start deciding, okay, like are we going to make move because then the trade deadline comes up in a month and a half, right? So that'll be an interesting one for sure. I'll just ask you lastly, I know you're dialed in on Canada basketball all the time. Um, I think the final for Canada's group is now finalized for the men's team. It's going to be Greece, Canada, Spain, and Australia. That's a that's going to be a tough group. They've got a, a exciting but challenging Olympics coming up, I think. Yeah, it's a bloodbath for sure. And I think <laughs> I think in terms of um, having uh, the depth of the NBA experience for sure. Um, Canada, I think, is a bit ahead, right? But there's a lot of talent in the Euro League, and so let's not let's not um, let's not um, underestimate um, what these other teams are able to do. I, you know, I was Australia was my sleeper pick. Australia was my sleeper pick to upset some people. Hopefully it's not us. That's all I'm going to (laughs) say. Hopefully not. Hopefully not. Now I'm sure we'll dive deeper into that as time goes on because there's there's lots of time between now and then, and it's going to be uh, it's going to be a lot of fun to watch. But Coach O, it was great to chat some uh, Raptors with you, and great to have you once again back on the podcast. It's always a pleasure. Happy we were able to get together and do this after a long hiatus.